Well, good morning, church. Oh, isn't God good? Yes, he is. And the sunshine in Michigan is good also, right? I like to see some sunburns in the room. That's awesome. And my man Flossin down front, awesome. You got mad skills. I love it. He's a great dancer. You got him. He was totally worshiping Jesus with that floss right there. Um, but I just want to welcome you. If you are a guest this morning, we are so excited that you are here. If you're joining us live stream, welcome. It is a privilege that you came and chose to worship the Lord with us this morning. Are you ready for the word? All right. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, and we're going to bounce in between 21 and 22 this morning. Pastor Richard is in Florida taking care of his dad. He texts me, text me this morning, just wanted us to know that he is praying for us and he misses us. Uh, so he is not here this morning. So if you're still confused, I'm bringing the word this morning. All right? So, all right, let's pray. Holy Spirit, do what I cannot do. I'm just your mouthpiece. I pray, God, that you would encourage, that you would build up, and set your kids free to do what you've called them to do. Amen. Amen. So, a few years ago, we moved into a new subdivision in Oxford. We moved from Lake Orion to Oxford, and uh, we moved into this house, and there was a family that had, you know, when we were meeting them, you know, signing documents, they said the reason they were moving was because they've outgrown this house, okay? We were excited. We were coming from like a little 760 square foot house where, um, you know, we had two bedrooms and then Jude slept in a pack and play in the kitchen, okay? So we're thinking this house that we're moving into is awesome. I mean, it is huge. So we were like, wow, this house is too small for you? And they were like, yeah, our kids are older, and so we just, we just need more room. And so they moved across, um, the, kind of across the road, down the street, into this lake, into this beautiful lake house. And, um, and so anyways, we really didn't have any more contact after them unless we couldn't figure out something else. But as we moved in this house, uh, as we started living there, weeks would go by, months would go by, and this random middle school boy kept showing up, Okay. We literally would walk past our house like this. Sometimes he would ride his bike. And he was always going through our cul-de-sac. Now there's only four houses in our cul-de-sac, so it's pretty obvious if you don't live there that you're just trying to see something. And I am like, what in the world is this kid doing? Well, I mean, we just kind of got used to it. He would always be around. You would say hello to him. He would say nothing. He would just keep on moving. Well, one day, almost a year later, one day Josie was playing out in the backyard and she comes running in and she says, Mom, there is a weird boy who just came out of the woods. And he said he wants to see his house. And I was like, what? So I come out there and there is that teenage middle school boy coming out of the weeds. I mean, it was like a movie, guys. I'm not telling you. He's coming out of the weeds. He kind of looked like Mowgli. He had long hair. I don't know if he'd been raised, but no. Um, but he came out, and I was like, can I help you? And he goes, yes. He said, this was my house. And he said, could I please just come in and see it? I just really miss it. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to bring you into my house. You just came out of the woods. You've been creeping us all out with your slow watching. And I was like, and he's like, but I just, I loved this house. Can I just, can I see it? And so I said, all right, you can come into the main level, but that's about it, okay? So anyways, we brought him into the house and I let him come in and he's like, can I see my old room? And I said, nope, that's where you stay. We're just doing the main level. And he started telling me that he just didn't like his new house, that he missed being here, that he loved this house. And I was thinking about it because I think many of us, if we thought about it, we can relate to this young man. You might be in a new season, just like him, where his family was blessing him, bringing to a home with new blessings, with new opportunities, new relationships to be made. He can actually grow and have his own space. Maybe you're in a new season of life. 
a season that you've wanted to be in. Maybe you're married for the first time, or maybe you're empty nesters for the first time. Maybe you're retired. Maybe you have another child on the way, and you're in a new season, but there are moments in every new season that difficulty can come. And in those moments when things don't feel the same way, as comfortable or as easy as that past season seemed to be, there is a temptation just like this young man to just want to go back to the familiar. To want to go back to what was known. Anyone ever track, anyone feel that way? Maybe it's a past relationship. Maybe it's a past job. Maybe it's a season where you just felt so close with the Lord. And so there's this longing between what happened and what was to the season that God has you in right now. I love the Holy Spirit. I could not have asked Ben, Ashley, and our missionary all to weave in everything that they did. It, I just felt so Oh, encouraged by the Holy Spirit because there is a common thread that the Holy Spirit is wanting you to hear this morning. And he's wanting to encourage you in the season that you are in. And it's not about us. It's about him. And so this morning, I want to look at a passage of scripture that I think many of us can relate to. And it's found in the book of John. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along or you can look on the screen. But we're going to start in John 21, starting in verse 1. It's a passage of Scripture where Jesus shows up to his disciples. For the third time after his death and resurrection, we see the disciples gathered together, and we see how Jesus recognizes that they are being pulled back to the familiar. They're being tempted to go back and look at what once was, even though they had experienced and even though he had called them into a new season of life. I am so thankful that the Word of God is truly a guidebook for life. John chapter 1, 21 says this, Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples besides the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Verse 3. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Anyone else go fishing this week? We had fishers already on our beach. I'm going fishing. And the guy said, we're coming too. So they went out into the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. So he called out, fellows, or guys, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't just haul in the net because there was so many fish in it. Then the disciples, Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled in the low net to the shore, for they were about a hundred yards away from shore. Verse 9. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them fish cooking over the charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. And there were large fish, and yet the net had not broken. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the, bed, the dead. The first thing I want to point out in this passage of Scripture is this. Number one, if you're taking notes, we are all tempted at times to go back to the boat when we have unmet expectations. We are all tempted to go back to the boat 
when we have unmet expectations. And can I put parentheses right here and say, especially when we have unmet expectations with God and ourselves. Let me get, make a little bit more specific. We all have our own boats. Most of us, it's not like Peter and the other fishermen. Maybe your boat isn't made of metal or wood, but maybe your boat, when you get discouraged or you feel frustrated or confused, maybe you are in the boat of self-preservation. Maybe your boat is religion. When you fail or when you see something inside of yourself that you don't like, that you don't change, instead of coming to the grace of God, maybe you run back to the boat, the list that you've got to go through so that you can feel made right. Maybe your boat is like mine and it's a bag of Twizzlers. I was off Twizzlers for a year and a half. It was a miracle. It was truly, okay, some of you don't understand, okay? I was raised with Twizzlers, okay? It was like our comfort food. You walk in the house, Twizzlers are always waiting for you. No matter what day school was like, Twizzlers were there. My children were raised with Twizzlers. They knew one food group will always be in our house. We might not know what we're having for dinner, but we got Twizzlers that are there. So a year and a half, I went off Twizzlers. And last May, we went down to the Carolinas to visit my family, and we were at the movie theater. Now, I hadn't, I hadn't gone back to Twizzlers, but I had, had a little bit of sugar. And I was like, all right, here's my thing. We're at a movie. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get a box of Milk Duds because I'm not addicted to those. They were all out. And my sister said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not having any Twizzlers. And she said, well, I have this whole bag of Twizzlers in my purse that some kid gave me. How can it hurt to have one little Twizzler? Just one. And I fell off the boat. That day, I actually gained five pounds eating Twizzlers between May and December. I kid you not, nothing else changed in my diet. I was still working out, no other sugar, no other chips, but Twizzlers alone were my boat. And why do I say that? It sounds silly, but we all have a thing, just like that teenage boy, just like Peter, when we have a rough day, or things don't go as planned, or maybe we're disappointed with ourselves or with the Lord, we all have a boat that we are tempted to go back to. I find it interesting that Jesus in this story, Jesus tries to prepare Peter for the disappointment and the unmet expectations that he was going to walk in. You see, Jesus knew that he was going to die and resurrect again. But he tried to prepare his guys. He tried to remind them, hey, in three days, I'm going to have to die. But in three days, I am going to raise again. And the guys are like, yeah, okay. And he's looking at him. He's like, no, I am going to have to suffer. And if you look in the scriptures, Peter comes up. And if you look in Luke chapter 22, after Jesus is trying to prepare his guys for his death and his resurrection in verse 33, Peter says, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, even before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. You see, Peter had an idea and an expectation of what his faith in Christ was like. But when his unmet expectations of what he thought Jesus was going to do all of a sudden changed, he found himself really seeing what was on the inside. Have you ever been disappointed by an unanswered prayer and been left in a place of confusion? And been wondering, what could have I done more? How many of us have been tempted to go into striving? Like maybe I didn't pray enough. How many 
many of us start trying to analyze and begin in the natural, figuring out where I went wrong? How do I get God to answer my prayers? You see, in the natural, we have a tendency of continuously viewing God through our point of view. But we are constantly being tempted to walk away from Jesus and his grace and who he is and to get back into the boat of trying to save ourselves. Peter was disappointed and probably very confused when they saw his Lord and Savior, his rabbi, his closest friend, all of a sudden be taken and accused and getting put on trial. Peter, the Bible says in verse, in chapter 22, it says that in verse 54, that he three times denied Christ, even knowing him, when he was confronted when Jesus was on trial. You see, Peter had expectations about himself. He believed that his faith and commitment to Jesus were stronger than anything that the enemy or life could throw at him. But in the moment when he felt disappointed and confused, the enemy knew right what was below the surface. What was Peter's expectations of himself built on? Was his expectations of his faith, of what he thought he would be like, was it built on his past? Was it maybe his leadership ability with on the 12? He scaled, he looked at the 12 and he said, ah, they might, they might fail Jesus, but not me. I, I'm kind of like your main dude. I'm like your leader here. Was it based on his personality strengths? You see, our expectations of ourselves, if they're not based on who Jesus says that we are, we are going to be disappointed. When I fell off the bandwagon with Twizzlers, as silly as it sounds, it affected me mentally and emotionally. Because I thought a year and a half of being off sugar. It made me feel like, oh, I got this. I can do this. I can have self-control. Anyone ever been there? When you were like, I am winning at this thing, right? Whatever it is, there was a certain area that you were like, man, Jesus put his finger on and I want to I wanna move forward in it. And you feel like you're doing so good. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself doing the very thing that you thought you would never go back to. I believe Peter was in this moment. Peter boldly told all of the disciples, I would die for you, Jesus. And yet, in a moment of disappointment, in a moment of fear, in a moment of confusion, instead of standing up courageously for his faith, we see him shrink back in fear, and we just see him deny Jesus three times publicly. And Scripture says, at the very end of this passage of Scripture, I'm not going to read it, but the very last verse I want to read, it says, And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Peter was devastated. I believe with Jesus, but I think he was also devastated with his life choices. But I think more importantly, I think Peter was devastated with himself. We are all human. And we are all broken. And Jesus knew who Peter was when he called him to follow him. He knew Peter's strengths. He knew Peter's weaknesses. He knew before he went to the cross for Peter that Peter was going to fail in this moment. And yet it did not change Jesus' opinion of Peter. What changed is Peter's expectations of himself. You see, I heard, a, I heard a quote the other day, and it said, unmet expectations can turn into silent resentment or bitterness. Let me say it again. Unmet expectations can turn into silent resentment and bitterness. I wonder if this is why Peter, after seeing the resurrected, 
resurrected Jesus, his rabbi that he knew died on a cross and yet had already appeared to him two times, already had spoken to him, already had shown him the wounds in his hands. I wonder if it was this silent resentment, this bitterness inside of him that wooed him to get back into his boat even after he had already seen the resurrection Jesus. Think about this. The one that he pledged to follow his life, the one who had died, the one who had caused the confusion and maybe the hopelessness and the pain and the, and the disappointment, he came back. We celebrated it last week on Easter Sunday. We celebrated the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter witnessed it firsthand. How many of us continually think that if Jesus would do this miracle, if he would do this monumental thing, then I can follow him again? Peter saw Jesus twice. Church, it's not about us getting our prayers answered and then we're going to follow passionately after Jesus again. It's about recognizing that we can actually have faith in Christ Jesus and still be living in our boat again. Number two, if you're taking notes, I said it like this, a little bit more eloquently. We can have faith in Jesus, but still choose to not live in resurrection life. Peter, after seeing the resurrected Jesus, still found himself going back to the familiar. He still found himself, after two times encountering Jesus, going back to his former way of living. Hebrews 12, 15 says this, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, so that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and may become defiled by it. You see, church, when we have unmet expectations, we have a choice. We can either be disappointed, confused, hurt, and bring all of that disappointment and bring it to the Lord and ask him to help you to bring healing, to bring hope, to say you are the way, the truth, and the light. You are everything I need. Isn't that what we just sang all morning? That everything that we need is in Jesus? Didn't he say that I am the great I am? He is everything, and he is the living Jesus. And yet we can know it in our minds. But if we don't give him our unmet expectations and our disappointments with him, with ourselves, with others, we can find ourselves going back to that place and staying in our boat. How many of us have traded our freedom to say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to forgive this time. How many of us have said, I'm going to trade and not live anymore and being forgiven because I continually mess up and so I'm going to live in a boat of shame? How many of us have traded in our passion for Jesus and for the lost and for our neighbors because it's easier to go back to the familiar? And we hide behind our children. We hide behind our busyness. Because there I won't be disappointed and hurt again. You see, Peter met the resurrected Jesus, and yet he chose not to live in the resurrection power. If we choose to hold on to disappointment and shame from unmet expectations instead of holding on to Jesus' grace, silent and resentment and bitterness will grow and it will affect more areas than what we really truly know. I think that's what the Hebrew writer was talking about. Don't let even a root of bitterness. It's because he knows that bitterness has a way of making our hearts start to get cold and hard. And sometimes when we go back to the familiar, it's that much harder to get back again. Why? Because the boat's filled with Twizzlers. How many of us have those things? And even though we don't like it, even though it's not as fulfilling as it once was, it's just comfortable. Right? The enemy knows that. 
That's why he doesn't bait you with somebody else's boat. You're literally looking at me like I would never eat Twizzlers. Sarah, that has no pull for me. But we all have our own Twizzlers. We all have our own boat. Choosing to hold on to disappointment and shame instead of grace makes us want to isolate, self-protect, and it hinders our passion and our purpose. And yet we see the effects oftentimes in the way that we treat our spouse, our family members, our coworkers, and even the Lord. Church life, Jesus said, has disappointments. It's the one thing he did promise. In this life, we will have trouble. But we have got to remember that he also said that he wants us to bring our trouble to him. He is the one that is inviting us to get out of the boat this morning. You see, I love Jesus' response to this, to this moment in Peter's life where he's back fishing. I love the response of Jesus. In this passage of scripture, you see three things that I just want to point out. The first thing I want to point out to you is that Jesus shows up in the morning. Parents, this should be encouraging. As a mama, there are times that I want to stop my kid before they even make a mistake. Anyone ever feel like that? It's called a helicopter parent. Don't be it, right? Jesus is not a helicopter parent. He wasn't like all of a sudden like watching and he's like, oh, 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 Peter's about to go back to the boat. Go no. He's like, no, 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 no. You don't see it. Parents, take a breath. Sometimes we have to learn from our mistakes. And you see Jesus show up in the morning. The scripture says that in the morning, Jesus was on land waiting for them as they were in the boat. And he calls out to them in the morning, hey guys, have you caught anything? Doesn't it remind you of the first time? Isn't it so wonderful that when Jesus shows up and we find ourselves back in a place of sin or back in a place of the familiar or back in the place of just saying, I don't know if I can keep doing it, but we're feeling tempted to go back, that he never uses shame or condemnation he came with an invitation for breakfast. You see, Jesus always comes with a relational invitation of love. He allows us to go back to those things, not because he's mean, but so that we could remember what it was like, how unfulfilling it is to go back to our old way of living. The Bible says that they fished all night long. And Jesus said, have you caught anything? I'm sure Peter in that moment, after they worked all that way, all the night long, all those hours, he was reminded of his old life. Man, remember when we would work and work and work and it just didn't produce anything fulfilling? When we go back to religion, when we go back to works, we're doing the exact same thing. We're making ourselves feel like we're being productive. I've got to burn my way back into forgiveness. I've got to be a better person. I've got to be better than this. Oh, I haven't looked at porn for like three weeks. Okay, well, I'll pay penance. I'll make myself suffer a while. Or maybe, I know I haven't followed Jesus like he's wanted me to, like I used to, but how about I just go and do this for, I'll read my Bible a little bit longer. You see, we all have areas where the enemy baits us with a boat, an opportunity to say, why don't you go back to the way that things used to be? But Jesus is always there in the morning and he's saying, hey, do you want to experience real fulfillment again? Do you want to come back into real grace and mercy and real love? Do you want to come back into relationship? The only thing that is going to bring fulfillment and healing to your soul. You see, Peter, 
was invited to breakfast by Jesus. Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Church, I don't care what it is that you found yourself that you said you'd never do. I don't care what it is. Jesus said, get out of the boat. There's no condemnation. Maybe you've gone back to fear. Maybe you've gone back to works. Maybe you've gone back to sin. Maybe, maybe whatever it is, Jesus is saying there is no condemnation. Will you get out of the shame? Will you get out of the boat that keeps you in an unfulfilled state? And will you come back into grace where there is real freedom? Where there is life, where the resurrection of Jesus truly can penetrate your heart and your lives and bring change. Because the third thing that I see, or the second thing that I see Jesus invite Peter into after it was breakfast, Jesus invited Peter into resurrection life. Not just faith. You can be saved by faith. But we are changed when we enter into the resurrection life that came for Jesus Christ. When he took all of the sin, when he took all of the shame, when he took all that we have ever done and ever will, and he died on that cross, the Bible says that when he died and he rose again, there is now fullness of life. Church, Jesus' desire is that Peter would not just live knowing that he was the Christ. Jesus wanted Peter to live in it, to be the rock, to fulfill the plans and the callings that he has on his life. He didn't want him just to live with faith and yet live in a prison. Church, your heavenly father this morning is calling us out of the boat in love and mercy and grace. He says, stop believing the lies of the enemy. Stop choosing to believe those familiar things and come into the fullness of life. But watch what he had to do in order to get there. Getting out of the boat was the first step. But John 21 says this, I believe this is the second step in what Peter had to go and he had to repent and turn. John 21 says this, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. Can you say that word, everything? He knows everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I've heard many messages on why Jesus asked him three times. To redeem the fact that he denied Jesus three times. He went back and even the charcoal fire, they say, is just like the charcoal fire that reminded Peter of when he denied Christ the first time. But ultimately, what I believe the message is, as I was reading it, Jesus wanted to engage Peter's heart. There is repentance that comes from our mind knowing that we've done wrong. But unless our soul and our heart and our emotions engages with Jesus, then we will continue to be locked into the prison and the feeling of shame and not enter into the full freedom. We can have faith and our souls will still be sick. And I believe that Jesus in his mercy was like, Peter, I don't want any shame to be left. I don't want there to be any doubt. And I really believe that when Peter felt grieved, another translation said, it's because Peter felt that weight 
As Jesus asked him a third time, as he remembered, I did it three times. The disappointment in himself. The disappointment that he probably felt because he publicly denied Christ and in front of other people, in front of these other disciples, Jesus is questioning his love and his loyalty. And I think when Jesus asked him that question, it was saying, Peter, I want to heal the insides of you. The disappointment in yourself. God's desire is that we would live in freedom. Jesus said that he came to set the captive free. And there are places inside of every one of us that the core beliefs are so deep and they are so triggered by the past that the Holy Spirit in his mercy and in his love, he says, let's stay on this a little bit longer because it's rooted in something more than just your faith. I know you believe, but I'm after your heart. I want to bring healing. James 5, 6 says this, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. Isn't it interesting that confession and prayer are connected to being healed? Because it's not just physical. When we sin, When we compromise, when we go back, it hurts all of us. And God in his grace and his mercy is inviting Peter into full restoration. And in order to be fully restored, we have to repent and we have to turn back to him. Isn't that what Jesus told Peter at the very beginning when he told him that you're going to deny me three times? How did he start it? He actually started it in verse 32. He says, I pleaded for you in prayer, Peter, that your faith would not fail. So when you've repented and turned back to me again, I want you to go and strengthen your brothers. Jesus, he knew that Peter was going to fall and he didn't change his plan. He didn't reverse the calling on Peter's life. God knows that all of us are broken vessels and yet he loves you just the same. He doesn't change the plans and callings for this season of your life even though we're tempted to go back to the familiar. He looked at Peter and said, when you fall, I'm going to tell you you're going to repent, you're going to turn back, and then I'm going to remind you to do what I've already called you to do. Church, that is God's mission and his heart for all of us this morning. God is inviting us to get out of the boat. The boat that we found ourselves going back to after we've experienced the freedom and the joy and the fulfillment of following him even in life's hard moments. He is inviting us to repent to give him our disappointment, to give him our guilt and shame, to give him the hard situations in our lives and say, God, this stinks, but I give it to you. And he's calling us to go back and follow him. Jesus said, feed my sheep three times. He's instilling the fact that in every season, when we are in a love relationship with the Lord, that he has a plan and a purpose for our lives. What Pierce was talking about, he's saying yes to Jesus. That is our same call. It is the same call in every one of our lives today. And so my question is, what has stopped you from saying yes to following Jesus the way that you once did? What has pulled you back into the boat or at least made you start walking back to the boat? Is it unmet expectations? Is it disappointments with yourself, with God or someone else that has tempted you to walk back into your old way of living? We have an epidemic of young, young adults, young Marys. We have an epidemic of them walking away from their faith because they are disappointed with what they've been told. But Jesus never lied. 
church, he never sold a, a cheap gospel. He said, come follow me, but he also said, come pick up your cross and follow me. Fullness of life happens on the other side of a life that is surrendered to Jesus. A life that says, it's not my way anymore. This boat represents my old life. When my husband and I have a fight, my old life says, you want justice. You want fairness. Fight for yourself. Defend it. But Jesus is saying, what do I say? Pick up your cross and follow me. When my children are responding in a way that stirs up fear inside of my heart, I feel the pull to go back and try to control, try to prepare, try to protect, try to do it in my own strength. And the Lord's like, or you could do it my way and you could surrender and pray and you can trust me with them. Whatever it is in your life today, I want to encourage you. The Heavenly Father loves you so much that he wants to remind you just because you know you have faith in Christ, he wants to call you again out of the boat and into the fullness of life. You're called to follow Jesus, to say yes. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Oh, worship team, if you'll come.